Okay, so I'm just going to introduce the speaker. So uh, uh, Nick um, actually contacted me because he had uh, read the book I had written. So this is the like the power of outreach, right? You can uh, <laughs> you can reach uh, people that have similar interests to you in uh, uh, all parts of the world. So that was great. So we had some. Uh, uh, exchange this and he was also interested in um, one of my research uh, projects that had been running for quite a while called the biotomatic project I don't, I don't know if you will talk about that very much but anyway it's a kind of a an example of a innovation um, oriented project that had to do with the construction industry which is also where Nick's uh, research interests uh, uh, lie and then he um he was able to get a, a grant to come here and uh, visit and uh, look into the Norwegian landscape of uh, um, innovation and research. And so I think uh, uh, he has uh, now been going around for uh, the last few weeks talking to all kinds of people. Uh, and I think he has some very nice insights now into how things work and maybe some, some things that you guys haven't thought about before, so I think this should be interesting for a lot of us. So uh, I look forward to hearing what you have to say, uh, Nick. Nick? Okay. Um, yeah, uh, I guess I'll stand here so that people can you see me on the, on the screen if I don't stand in the way of the, or can you hear me in Zoom land? Is that all right? Yeah, we can hear you. Okay. Yes, it's working. All right. Um, so thanks for hosting me. Uh, I'm a third year about to graduate uh, here in a couple of weeks from Arizona State, um, graduate student uh, with the, in the master's program for biomimicry and the master's program for uh, construction technologies and construction management. So, um, and the last three years, in addition to the regular master's uh, curricula, my research thesis asked the question about what are the, how do we compare and what are the useful analytics that could come from looking at evolutionary ecology and looking at an innovation ecosystem and trying to not just come up with lofty, pithy analogies, but What's the map that's there? Mm -hmm. uh, and there were some interesting insights because, you know, fundamentally, these are two different systems. They really are. The characteristics of innovation and the characteristics of evolutionary ecology, the conditions under which both operate are different. But at the same time, there is enough there. And I'll walk through it a little bit in the presentation to be able to draw some insight and as we develop our own technologies specifically within decision support and uh, software ai etc there's a lot there this is my my thesis is that there is a lot there in evolutionary ecology that does translate it can be abstracted and then the math can be applied uh, so that's the selling point, um, or I guess really the why, the why, why it sells at all is because, you know, for me, um, being in construction technology management where I want to be, it has to do with convincing the client, convincing the engineer, convincing the uh, the procurement uh, specialist, the the cost uh, engineer, the risk and uh analyzers all of these people that come from their own discipline and their own fields and their own dominant design their way of doing things and convincing them that it's worth uh investing in a pilot project and so i i try to work in that part of innovation that is i take the work that you guys are doing you guys take it and move it down the assembly line and it it gets developed you bench test it you do it in the lab, you publish papers on it, and then all of a sudden now we're we're ready to have some sort of um, we have a working prototype and we want to see if it's commercially viable. 
that's where I want to work. Um, comparing you all here in research, you're way upstream. And that's a critically important part, right? Because you're doing the things that are really, really hard. And you're doing back of the napkin sketches, whiteboards. This is my imagination of what you're doing. What I actually hear, I, I only saw a little bit of it, mostly in the theoretical physics lab. Um, but they, but I assume that you're all doing the same sort of thing, just ideating and researching and publishing about these things that require an extraordinary amount of expertise. And then where does it go? How do you know that what you're doing all the way upstream here trickles down and makes its way up into innovation and impact? And so that's kind of the theme uh, of where I am with this presentation. So, um, so I'll make it really quick. Uh, this is based off of my, my thesis work. I've got four sections. I put the quiz up front. Um, and I also put in a video. So this is the, this is the quiz. So if you have a smart device, please humor me. And I've got the, um, the code, if you want to go that way, from menti.com. I also put a QR code, and I tested it, and it does work. Um, but now, of course, it won't, right? But please, yeah, put anything up there. This is for, and it should populate, if I did it correctly, it should populate right in front of us. The other point to this is, too, uh, in engagement, you know, some of us are probably feel a little bit more introverted and don't want to just stand up and start belting what they think. So, um, and that's me. Uh, so I put this there for my own comfort. But as you enter, what, like, how do you define innovation? One, two, three words. You should be able to put it into the poll and it should start populating. I mean, it's basically doing something that's not been done before. So novelty? Yes. Okay. Yeah, and it depends, of course, in the context that you're talking about, in the scientific context of the business in the context. Yes. Mm -hmm. is, so is there a difference then from the scientific context and the business context? Yeah, uh, only in terms of uh, uh, the end use of uh, innovation. I mean, yeah. in that business, uh, you're obviously ultimately uh, interested in something you can sell and make a profit on. And in um, science, you're interested in advancing the frontiers of science. But they both require innovation. So you said something there that I think is there's a key thing that, and it's recognizing what the, the value is. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Oh, yes, yeah. they have to have value. Uh, I mean, you can obviously, of course, have new things uh, uh, they don't have uh, uh, value or won't have value for a very long time. Um, you know, that often happens. But, uh, uh, discoveries are made and they don't have any immediate applications, but decades down the road, uh, they often turn out to be very. Uh, important for one reason or another. I should have just come here because that took me about 18 months of a literature review to get to that that insight. I don't know if this is yeah I don't know if it's working. Way. Have people been able to, to get it? Um try myself here. Have you been able to enter things in? Has anyone been able to? Yeah, it talks this, uh, this, uh, the, the picture and everything. And mm -hmm. your, uh, we received your input, but I don't think it's uh, updating. Well, let me see. Yeah, I can give you an example for it. 
uh, you know, Harold Johnston at the um, University of California at Berkeley was uh, working for many years on uh, fundamental uh, research on nitrogen oxygen uh, chemistry, and nobody seemed to be terribly interested in that until uh, it became very important uh, in combustion and uh, uh, depletion of atmospheric ozone. So we got um, something useful. Who, who is that? I don't want to call you up, but that's really that. Right, and that's what we're talking about: creating something new or realizing potential of something. So the potential of something, that's a that's an interesting theme too. Um, making something new, yes. New solutions to new problems, which probably speaks really well to back here in the upstream. This requires value. Solution-oriented research and creating. And were there any other examples? Yeah. Recreation. Mm. Okay. Should have rehearsed this part just a little bit better. It worked last night when nobody was watching. <laughs> Part of the part that isn't good. Um, is that on your screen? No. Or is this not? It's like stuck in three net mode almost. Okay, so this was the next one, was what are the greatest challenges to innovation? Really well done. This one back here. I can give you guys a couple minutes to enter there. Any others? Ah. So come ideas, is that coming up with ideas like ideation? Well, what I encountered quite a lot in industry was uh, uh, if you came up with a new idea and uh, presented it to uh, uh, people that were working in that uh, area, they would tell you we've already done it. But very often they really hadn't already done it. That's got to be a, and I imagine here, right, when you're talking about advancing the frontiers of science, and so you're talking about gold from that basic research. Product, product oriented uh, research. What do you mean? Uh, well, uh, you know, for example, uh, uh, one area that I was involved in was. Uh, uh, high strength uh, 
fiber like uh, catalog, and uh, you might come up with a new polymer uh, on the basis of some preliminary work compared to be uh, a very promising alternative for uh, performance or economic reasons. And so what was the challenge there? The, the, the challenge was that the people that could actually implement this make a business out of it were not very receptive uh, because uh, they were a bit defensive. And as I say, a, a, a response that you often got was, we've already done that. But when you went, went back and looked at what they'd really done, uh, it was not the same. Does anyone else want to comment on this? You might call that something like institutional uh, resistance or resistance. Uh, also in terms of the like scientific culture. When you just provide a new idea that actually uh, like challenge the culture, for example, of engineers, that's complicated, <laughs> really. <laughs> I mean, the engineers being often like, for example, in companies, uh, the leaders, the managers, and then you know you're right, but the difficulty to convince them that like, your budget should provide them is uh, valuable. This is this is a big challenge. Uh, and so the 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 key point. Right. That I want to make in there's a, a difference here between invention, right? Just generating something new, a new idea, testing a new idea, um, coming up with a new technology, developing these new things in science, and innovation, because innovation has this very subjective characteristic about it, which is realizing the value of your invention and the more complex that the ecosystem is the more developed and established it is like somebody says sticky ideas right like that stickiness and that that inertia there's going to be more of it there's a very in the innovation framework kind of system planning side there there's this concept of Ex exploration and exploitation or creation and making things better, right? Because they're both innovating. And you have to, like the engineer is there because the, the engineer knows how to do what's already been done very well, right? The engineer is is working in, a, in, in that mindset of practical expertise, right? They are they are the people that are doing something 10,000 times. And they don't really know whether they're doing it 10,000 times right or 10,000 times the best. They just know that it works for the context that they're doing. And when they do it 10,000 times, then they do become very sticky because, and you don't know how valid the, the no is either. But it's important that we have people that can do something 10,000 times and really get very good at what's already been innovated. And it's important too, that we have people out there uh, scouting on the frontiers of science and scouting for new technologies as they're emerging and becoming useful. And so this is a, um, a very well-known, uh, 2012 came out in uh, the Harvard Business Review, I believe. Um, but and I think they were working for Deloitte at the time, but not the top. And it also there's another riff on it that McKinsey picked up as the three horizons of innovation within their three horizons framework too. But this is what those those other stakeholders that you're talking about in the innovation ecosystem. What is innovation? The you know what are my challenges? Funding, right? Realizing that value. So in the business model, in, inside Horizon One, you have these core innovations, my core operations, the things that my business does, and that's bigger, faster, stronger, smaller, 
more mostly resulting in tightening the margins on an existing product in an existing market. Uh, then we have adjacent horizon two. That means that something exists in another market or another system, and I can adopt that technology to realize value in my market. Then we have horizon three, which is blue water. And what they said, uh, they being on Cloud, they said that your traditional business model is going to allocate if they're healthy. And this is generalized, it's totally, you know, it's not it's not complex enough to really realize the situation that is every single product, every single company, but generally speaking, about 70% of your your resource allocation, your whether you're talking about the ideas that you that you have, the time that you have, the, the work power that you have, or the funding should really belong here. And trying to get better over the course of people who are doing 10,000 doing 10,000 repetitions. And that is still innovation. So when Coca-Cola figures out that they can substitute an ingredient or they can um, they can take six packs but distribute them in pallets of 24 packs and they can save 12 cents in each uh, in the margin of, of each unit. That that is innovation. That is innovating within the core, right? Uh, um, within that core business model. When, when you get an iPhone and when you back up and you remember what iPhone was in the, like the year 2008, you back up some more and you remember what the, the iPod and the MP3 player was, mm -hmm. like the iPhone isn't necessarily anything new. It's a new aggregation of technologies into a single form factor. That's the JSON. You're realizing new value within the existing markets by coupling and over uh, stacking functions, so to speak. Transformational blue water is when you, there's is take it, this is the hardest to do. It requires the most time. It requires the most skill. It requires the most amount of of um, resourcing, really, to get one idea, and it has the highest attrition rate. And that's where we are all kind of trying to work because maybe we somewhere either we say we have the skill, the ambition, the aptitude, the, the passion to do this, to change the world, to be world changers. Uh, but also the odds are very much not in our favor, right? But it's important because that second, where they say over the course of time, the ROI from innovating just within your core is really only going to give you 10%. So if you want to grow, if you want to have a business growth, or you want to grow your field, you can expect it. you can only grow so much within innovating within the, the first horizon. 20% of your return on, about, uh, on investment is going to come from horizon two. 70% is going to come from that 10% that's in the field that we want to work in. So interestingly, Verizon 2020 and right around that time, uh, ISO adopted the standard, but it comes out of the space industry. So the technology readiness levels, a little interesting piece of trivia comes out of uh, the NASA shuttle missions. Um, but these are important just for kind of understanding the framework of what we're doing and, and where we're trying to work, right? Like this is the value chain uh, back of the napkin to 70% creating a new market, right? Uh, with a new product and a new design. And a lot of the people that I came over here and I was speaking with uh, specifically in, in the Norwegian innovation, most tended to be in one, two, one and two. I spoke to a number of people that were at around technology readiness level six, or trying to incubate to get things out of the lab and into the operational environment. Um, and I do believe that those are two of the, the biggest bottlenecks within the innovation value chain because there's these are really important functions. If you want to, if you want to innovate, then and you want to innovate better, 
then you, there's a couple conditions that need to be set. And, and one of one of the goals has to be the the generation of ideas. Somebody said ideas was a challenge, like coming up with new ideas. The volume of ideas that are that are making it from inside the head onto the back of the napkin into a published paper, that has to go up or nothing happens. And that's the beginning of the cascade. The, the next bottleneck then, or in that bottleneck still, is the variation of ideas. And that's why it's really important. One of the things that really attracted me to want to come out and uh, mortgage as much of Anya's time as I could was the work that um, that you're doing in the trying to stand up a center for interdisciplinary education and trying to work on on engagement from the science community and trying to expose because what you're trying to do is you're trying is this is a very common trade-off in evolutionary ecology and adaptive evolution is this this um, give and take that exists between surface area and volume mm -hmm. right so it's vol volume of ideas surface area within that the cell right that innovation cell can connect to other cells and diffuse information and resources across a membrane those are that's critical um i'll make a couple more comments about that later but i just for what what i've observed just anecdotally has been really seeing that in action and how you're trying to design and and, and solve problems around that bottleneck is very uh, inspiring. Um, but then there, then there's this other part that goes on, and that's the selection. So now we've ideated and we've created this plethora of ideas. We have information sharing. And now we need to choose, figure out how to make a more effective to realize the the best amount of value within those trade-offs. So it's volume, it's surface area, and it's selective fitness. That's one of the key things that translates between the two, innovation and evolution, and it translates in these bottlenecks here. So that's always, always like a key finding for me. OK, so uh, I, that's the innovation side. Now, just to kind of go back around to the biomimicry side. Um, for me, uh, I spent 20 years in the in the United States Marine Corps. Uh, most of my time I spent in uh, Special Operations Command. And at the end of my, like my last assignment uh, that I retired out of, I was working um, in at the, what we would call the operational level. So my interfaces are sandwiched in between, I'm middle management. I'm advising a middle manager, but a very powerful one. And my interface is a direct membrane to the executive levels of, of national strategy and in, international cooperation, and then the tactical actions and the employment of, of new technologies. And I worked in the innovation space and, and managed innovation pipelines and science and technology and research development uh, for that. And as I was coming to the end of my career, I, I was thinking, what am I going to do next? And it really spoke to me, uh, this, this idea, right? Because I had this almost the satisfaction of, um, of so many words that start with the letter D, right? We're spending 20 years doing destroy, disrupt, deny, degrade, and I really wanted to focus the next 20 years or so on creating and building and fostering connections and making positive change, regenerative change. And so that's a bit of my personal philosophy, but there was only so many avenues I was going to go down, and most of them were going to lead somewhere to connecting people, connecting ideas, and connecting to nature. And so that gets to biomimicry. In 1997, Janine Benes wrote this book. She published it, Biomimicry, which is innovation inspired by nature. This is her definition, which Janine Benes is one of the co-founders of Biomimicry 3.8 uh, out of Missoula, Montana, and they do nature-inspired innovation consulting. Um, the key term here is conscious, uh, being aware of trying to emulate 
right? Not just making an obvious um, an obvious translation of something that you see, like a sustainability uh, using producing a lot of carbon is bad, so we don't want to do that because and and by the way, incidentally, nature doesn't do that. It's one kind of erroneous, and two, it's not really emulating consciously um, what's going on within the evolution and the adaptation. Oops. The next one, uh, so Dana Baumeister is the other co-founder of Biomimicry 3.8, and she's also the, the supervising director of the Biomimicry Center at Arizona State University. She does a lot in the, the education and training space, but also in the consulting space. And this is from our principal textbook in that program. This is her definition coming out of that, or their definition from, there were a couple of authors there, but learning from and then emulating natural forms. Uh, processes and ecosystems to create sustainable design. And that part there, the, the learning from, really important, and sustainable design, very important. Because in principle, in an evolutionary context, life is going to create conditions conducive to more life. Whether you're looking at ecosystem succession or you're looking at um, you're looking at product innovation. The idea is to you don't want to salt the earth. You want to create sustainable conditions that everything can go on and get better. And then learning from is really important. In the there's a kind of a philosophy that underlies all of this, and that's um, putting yourself in the position to observe and learn from, not just exploit and extract. And that, so there's a little bit of a difference then between biomimicry uh, as a emergent field, specifically in the, the, the pedagogical sense that we're talking about at Arizona State University and biomimicry 3.8 and other sort of design by analogy bio apps. And uh, these, these are straight out of the, the international standard definitions. Um, but one of the, the key things there, biomimeticism, biomimicry is understanding that philosophy. But one of the really common things though is this interdisciplinarity. It's requisite. Um, you have bio-inspired is kind of a general umbrella term for everything that you're, whenever you're taking something that's an analogous piece of information in the biology and you want to translate it to a design or engineering problem, then you're working within that uh, that bio-inspired design realm or, or science realm. Um, and there's another one that I didn't put on here because it's not really called out necessarily in the standard, but it would be bio-utilization um, and bio-assisted. So bio-utilization, I want to use uh, algae to absorb carbon because algae, each of these little, you know, phytoplankton are their own little carbon direct air capture machinery. And they're very efficient and they make themselves empower themselves off the sunlight. Uh, so it is cost efficient to do that, um, but it's not necessarily bio-mimicry in the sense that we're not emulating, we're utilizing biology. Uh, in context. Um, and so the, the why for that is principally 3.8 billion years of evolutionary history is a lot of research and design. And it's also a lot of failure too, right? Not more than 99% of the, any species that's ever lived on this earth is extinct. Um, that's because the conditions change, the context change, the landscapes change, and life goes on. But it's still to say that there are con con operating conditions on planet Earth that, that create engineering challenges, scientific challenges that, uh, that can be overcome and that biology and ecology have evolved and adapted to overcome them. So we can learn from that and using that information offsets material and energy and resource expenditure to arrive at the same failed conclusion. So to the engineers then, we've already tried that. 
no, I don't want to, no, I need to stay here and stake my claim. Also, nature has already tried it for 3.8 billion years, and your 40 year career is not quite the same. Um, this, this phrase, unique, non-obvious, and inimitable, uh, I borrowed that from some lecturers at MIT, and, and um, but it ended up being like the thing when I was grading papers uh, throughout graduate work, that those were the three things that I would harp on the most students. But when you want to create, in, when you want to innovate, specifically when you want to do transdisciplinary innovation or interdisciplinary cross-domain innovation. Unique, not obvious, and inimitable is what translates the value. If it's not unique, then what are you doing? You're not advancing the frontiers of science. You're on the exploitation curve. If it's not, if it's obvious and it generally applies, you're not really creating something of value. And if it's if it's imitable, if somebody could arrive to that same conclusion without ever touching your domain, you aren't bringing, you aren't realizing the value of your own expertise and your scientific knowledge. So, uh, and then the last one is nature-centered and regenerative, and that's going back. There's these three uh, within the framework of biomimicry. There are three uh, essential elements: there are ethos, um, reconnection and emulation and so in order to be a considered uh within the the framework of biomimicry to be a biomimicry design like to be doing biomimicry um they get expressed within this neat little diagram that comes from biomimicry 3.8 and it kind of sums up the entire pedagogy for what it is on one one slide uh, but the key thing here is that these principles around the outside edge, uh, there's six of them, six primary principles, they are the framework that is the deep pattern. So these are the things that any evolutionary adaptation has to satisfy in order to be uh, have that selective and inclusive fitness in order to create conditions conducive to life. And then we break down underneath each one, uh, sub principles, and then and we can use those in the design process uh, to set goals, to set non negotiables, uh, to talk about where progress that can be measured uh, in the evolution of a, of a technology or a science. And, and then we later go back and evaluate it. Um, the application of it, the, remember back a couple in the definition slides, there's form, process, system. Um, so form, uh, one of the great, very classic uh, examples here is well tubercles on their fins have these, there are these bumps, these ridges that are on the leading edge of the fin. And it almost doesn't make sense. Um, we would almost want to put them on the back or going just from, from our physics, but and our, and our knowledge of engineering and the way that we've always done it. But what actually happens here is there's little tubercles, and I know there's quite a few physicists in the room, so please humor me, but there's little tubercles, the bumps on the ridge line there. Uh, they disrupt the water in such a way that it creates a little buffer around the bin, and that little buffer separates the um, the disruptive layer from a continuous layer and the whale can swim more efficiently. And so that translated to technology and the design of wind turbines that could spin more efficiently, that could capture more energy, but require less. Um, process, this is one that I spent a lot of time working on uh, in my thesis, but the, the process for carbon, the utilization of captured carbon uh, in a calcium looping uh, to to get calcium carbonate aggregate, to make it like cement, the aggregate that goes into concrete. We're actually making binder uh, material itself, and we can that this biomineralization process that's pre Cambrian. Um, so, so to say, Cambrian is the the point in evolutionary history on the planet when 
life exploded and the oceans had oxygen in them and then a trophic cascade could evolve and we would get, you know, you had monsters of the sea and today we have salmon um, and halibut. But before all that, you had to have this ecosystem engineering capability and like 550 million years, 600 million years ago, um, that's when life, eukaryotic life and prokaryotic life even were mineralizing. That's like the cliffs of Dover are, are used the same genetic or would have used the same genetic um, information to make that sediment that became the cliffs of Dover. Uh, the Great Barrier Reef is uh, another example, 8,000 years old. And then system is what, where I spent um, most of my time in my study on looking at systems dynamics specifically and making those comparisons between evolution and innovation. And so uh, in order to, to make that transition, in order to make it worthwhile, right, you have to go through the process and you're scoping and then at the end of scoping, you're, you're scoping your problem, you're outlining it, you're saying, what am I going to spend money on? What am I going to spend my resources on? What are my goals? How am I going to measure progress in this uh, innovation project? And then you have to intentionally go into the emulation and the discovery phase. So we're going to scope it, a common process to go from uh, challenge to biology. So we're going to scope out the innovative challenge, which is what I did, uh, understanding how innovation systems work, understanding the framework that we have in order to leverage the system dynamics and make innovation happen, and then distilling out a function um, so that we can get relevant answers from biology that will work within the context both ways. That function is that that's that translational piece. Uh, so originally I looked at from the innovation side, I was trying to ask how how does nature incorporate novelty? Uh, how does nature um, create change in a field that has a dominant design? These are some of the comparatives. So again, um, I'm I'm quoting here from there's a, a number of different uh, researchers that have looked at different ways to to do this translational work. Uh, I I kind of I got introduced to this paper early on, and they had um, produce a database, but that was easy to kind of navigate and, and expand. But essentially, that function, which you're what you have to distill down to, is the action verb and uh, and that direct object that you're modifying. Um, so these are some of the ones that were I was looking at from both of the systems that were extracted from there. Sometimes we'll have secondary functions. So in innovation, you have the change function, creating change, uh, introducing change, all of those things. And then you have um, mitigating risk. Uh, and so identifying and sensing risk with the secondary function. And what I came up with for like a biologically relevant, introducing an adaptation in an existing ecosystem. These are some of the mechanisms uh, that nature has and the, that achieve this strategy. But I'd rather than bore you with too much of that, uh, there are some really relevant insights, but I wanted to circle back. One of the, in the evolutionary philosophy of biomimicry, uh, Danella Meadows, who Anya references in her book, but Danella Meadows was out of that club of Rome that uh, wrote The Limits to Growth. And in that, subsequent, she, she published this uh, paper in 1999, and it identifies these leverage points in the system and places to intervene. And, and think the, uh, thinking about this, back in terms of where those bottlenecks are and technology readiness and where you're working within the, that spectrum of innovation or the gradients of innovation. But you, they're numbered from kind of least impactful 
So where uh, it's most impactful and where you're innovating within a core, um, like the core business, Horizon Whoa. 1, and moving out to Horizon 3 and in the blue water. And in the blue water, you know, ideally the work that we're doing, if we're doing a life's work, we're putting 40, 60 years of a hundred year life invested into changing the world and making it a better place and creating conditions conducive to life. You know, we're going to bump up against this, you know, and hear mindsets and paradigms and power to transcend paradigms. Otherwise, the engineers are going to be always just telling us no and the bean counters, et cetera. What was really interesting was in 2007, after Janela Meadows passed away, um, she had a memoir kind of that she put out. She had written, I think, privately or maybe had limited distribution, but then her husband and her colleagues uh, put out, published this paper uh, posthumously. Um, and it's called The History and Conclusions to the Limits of Growth. So, Limits of Growth became a very uh, central. Uh, book and discussion of innovation policy and and really for uh it's kind of at that that gateway point um to sustainability and and um and ecology like conservation innovation uh and to where we are today while we talk about things like barbie capture and why it's so important um but what she said was after 30 years of doing this uh, because the the original uh, models that they did in the Club of Rome, and they were modeling Earth and trying to use ecology like a massive Earth size ecological model as an eco, uh, economics model. So after 30 years of doing this, this is these are the things that I that we just kept bumping into. So no matter how good the model got in 30 years, no matter how good we got at modeling uh, evolutionary ecology we still ran into these, these policy assumptions. And when I read this the first time, it really kind of hit me because I, I was working, as I'm going through this, uh, um, this graduate program, I'm working, like I said, at that threshold where all the inertia is, could possibly be between executive level decision-making, president, secretary of defense, Senators, you know, et cetera, and tactical where I came from, um, employing new technologies out on in the operational environment. And these were the things that I ran. So when you go back to realizing transformational change, transforming the paradigms of the system. The, these are like Danella Meadows is, is even posthumously one of has influenced research all over the world and still one of the one of the best innovators and thinkers on it would say, well, this is this is really human nature, is what it is. Um so I wanted to just give you an example of um, where I landed. Uh, I can get it to come up. Hopefully, the sound place too. Um, is there sound on this? Uh, no, it's on this one. It's on that one. How do I turn it off? We got the video online. Uh, I do have the video online. Okay. Would you like me to put it online? Yeah, perhaps. Yeah. The video keeps rolling on. Um, yeah. And Anya, I think this is probably a repeat for you. So you've already seen this. Um,
always feel like I'm fighting technology. I'm giving a lecture on innovation. Science drives. My son helped me with this. And he, Why does meds need to be bold? Well, the cement industry wants to get the net zero carbon emissions by the year 2050, but that's going to require a lot of change. See, by 2050, there's going to be 2.5 billion more people living on the planet, and most of them are going to be living in cities. So we'll need a lot more cement and concrete to build all those homes. But it's really challenging to innovate in the cement industry and bring new materials in. So what do you think would happen if we did nothing? Um, <laughs> I hope not. So what are we going to do about it? Well, this whole project is about innovating in the cement and concrete industry. We're going to ask questions and find out what the barriers are, and then we're going to look to natural evolution to figure out if there's ways to innovate better. What's biomimicry? It's when people replicate something in nature. You mean emulate? No, replicate. Well, emulate is a little bit more deeper, like the behavior of the nature, not just the form. Oh. Yeah, and nature uses the set of life's principles, like evolve to survive, to create conditions that are conducive to life. Wow, that sounds very sustainable. Nature is only sustainable. How does nature innovate? Well, it doesn't. Uh, nature evolves. Do you know how the two are different? No. Well, evolution relies on natural selection, and innovation relies on people to think about what would be the most fit. And so evolution solves for the needs of the ecosystem, and innovation solves for the needs of people. So nature experiments a lot more in evolution than we do in innovation, but there's also going to be a lot more failures. For innovation, we try to decide ahead of time which experiments are going to be the most successful. So which do you think is better? I don't know. Well, innovation has a lower failure rate, around 40%. Evolution is probably 80 to 95%. So innovation is more efficient, but evolution tends to be more effective. Yeah. Trade-offs are the way that nature realizes the limits to its own growth. It's like when you go to the store and you only have a dollar and you want gummy bears, which are 54 cents, and you want chocolate, which is 60 cents, you're now over a dollar by 14 cents. So what nature would do is it would only get 50 cents of gummy bears or and 50 cents of chocolate or maybe more or less, but it would still stay within that dollar. That's why you don't see a lot of slow animals with loud colors unless they have another way to defend themselves. An evolution maker is always making trade-offs. Like heavy, but armor, and light, but fast. That's right. It's mostly trade-off in innovation. Exploration and exploitation. People like to create new things, but we also have to improve the things that we have. Both evolution and innovation learn from the past. So what was successful before becomes a template for the future, but there's usually little changes from generation to generation. Like how the video games that you play are different from the video games that I play. Is that a dragon? It is. And evolution explains why we don't have dragons that have wings sprouting out of their backs. But dinosaurs have wings. Some did, and when they did, they evolved from their forelimbs. Well, it turns out that they came from the forelimbs of their ancient crustacean ancestors. Crustacean? Yeah, like a shrimp. 
So dragonflies came from shrimp? So more like shrimp and dragonflies both came from a common ancestor. You mean a dinosaur? Probably more like an ancient sea bug. In fact, the four times that life has evolved flight on planet Earth, each time it came from an arm that changed into a wing. So if we did have dragons, their wings would be like their arms, not spread back. That's right. Wait, what do dragons have to do with cement and concrete? I guess the point is that cements and concrete have been around for a really long time. I mean, we've been using them for thousands of years. Thousands? I thought that we were only using them for hundreds. The dome of the Pantheon from ancient Rome is almost 1900 years old. Even nature uses cement. It does? Yeah, the Great Barrier Reef is built by coral and it's 8,000 years old. And then the White Cliffs of Dover were from the biomineralization of these tiny little algae. And that's from like 100 million years ago. Wow. The process for making the cement we use today is really only about 200 years old. And you have to take limestone and heat it up really hot, which takes a lot of energy and it releases a lot of carbon dioxide. So that's why it's bad? Well, it's not that it's bad. It's just that it's efficient, kind of, for industry. Well, how does cement evolve? The industry knows that they need to reduce their carbon footprint, and that's what they mean when they say they want to get to net zero by 2050. And the best way to do that is through the use of green cement technologies, ones that take less energy to produce or release less carbon dioxide and make use of recycled materials so we have to use less cement to begin with. So what can dragons and dragonflies teach us about how to evolve cements? That we we have to use what we have to evolve that we drag things. But it takes time. Yes, it takes time. Is twenty fifty enough time? Maybe if we start today. And if we don't, then we're going to be trying to sprout wings out the back. Pop. Oh. Oh. That would be kind of hard to get the changes that we need. Huh? Yes. Um, I'll be back with that. Yeah, so the, uh, the key points in there were some of the models that were extraordinarily relevant were looking at the flight, for example, and there was actually, that paper only just came out in 2020 um, with the dragonfly wings coming from crustaceans. So it was a kind of a bit of a mystery because prior to that, um, evolutionary ecology kind of thought that this was a case of this almost spontaneous evolution, right? Spontaneous adaptation that, uh, but it was, it, it wasn't, in line with the, the trend of how biological flight evolved. And so it was actually a, a foreland of that shrimp that moved up into the carapace and then extended backwards over time. And that's how insects uh, learn how to fly. Um, but it's, an, it's critical because there's a lot of also layover really in, in, in the, or overlay in the map that happens with how do I evaluate the risk of a new technology? Or how do I evaluate how difficult it is for this city, this industry, uh, this, this market to evolve? Um, and there are indicators that whether you're trying to quantify success rate uh, within genetic mutation, more interestingly, success rate of very weird mutations, um, like bizarre adaptations, like uh, the interhumanitary sensory organs that crocodiles have, um, for example. It's a very, they have a little sensory organ in their scales on their cheek that allow them to pick up on uh, like electromagnetism in the water. And it's a, it's a very unique sort of adaptation for their phyla. Um, 
but the moral is still the same, which is you can't ask you can't ask the engineers to suddenly become dragons, right? You have to you have to gradually move them there as we're advancing the frontiers of science. So that's that's it for that lecture portion. I'm curious if there were any questions, but I also know I want to be sensitive to your time because you guys entertained me for an hour. So thank you. Thank you for your presentation. Uh, I think we have a bit of time for some questions, either on phone time, on Zoom, or in the room. So if you have any questions. So what's really holding back the adoption of the field of all I mean, I can think of a few technical issues. So maybe not the uh, maybe these more sociological issues maybe are discussing. For example, uh, uh, variability of starting materials uh, during conditions. Uh, uh, what's your uh, take on this? Supply chain. Uh, there's the cement industry has been relatively same unchanged, 140, 150 years, right? By uh, how we the and it's evolved off of that premise that original Portland cement is going to be the most efficient, it's the best available. So it's the best in the trade-off between cost efficiency, time, and and um, and the strength characteristics of the design and mix. So all of the standards then come from that because we built the standards based off of that. And that's why we especially in ISO uh, based like British, any country that's a current or former relationship with um with British standards are very prescriptive. You will use this much original Portland cement in your mix. Um, and that all that to say is they haven't had the industry, those supply chains have not had to make any sort of transformational change. They don't have change management built in as like a, a function and they're, it's not efficient for them to invest in it. And it hasn't been for 120, 150 years multiple generations of family-owned businesses doing things or state-owned doing things the way that we've always done it because this is how we return this is how we eat tomorrow yeah, I, I thought there was pretty good evidence now that uh, geopolymer cement can be stronger than uh, ordinary Portland cement uh, and also uh, more resistant to environmental degradation that's right yeah, but it doesn't in, a, in effect, in, in having a better way to do it doesn't uh, has to overcome the perception of how difficult it is to change. So there is a social aspect of it, uh, unfortunately. But the good news is that where the bottlenecks in the system are, are really good places to intervene. If that's like the what do we do about it question is to look at um look at what's holding up pilot demonstrations and then capturing what was the where was the inertia and what was the barrier to getting that geopolymer in there. So there's there's always a couple of weird considerations specific to geopolymers too, which is uh like you said, it comes down a lot to the workability and the time setting. Um, anytime you change anything in the binder uh, in cement, then it becomes like the way that you've always done it for people that aren't working with geopolymers. Now, everybody in that construction project is now affected to the schedule and some resourcing. When does the truck show up? Are we doing precasts, et cetera? The fundamental change. Um, but all those things can be ameliorated by trying you have to do go back to those three principles for say increase the volume increase the variety and then work on the selection criteria and i assume the concern about potential liability if anything does go wrong is uh, a significant consideration uh, you know, for the industry it is that's a good also a good point for modeling 
I think it was something that you came across a lot in the RRI aspect of biozina. Um, if you, because you have, you have structures that are original Portland cement that are somehow like 70 years, 100 years old. Uh, not as many as more, probably more likely that they're 30, but you have it. And, um, and you don't necessarily have all of that evidence uh, to draw off of from geopolymers. And you might have, I mean, geopolymers are not necessarily a new technology. So you can show structural viability over time, but you can't show it at scale. And that's why modeling is so important and critical because if we can model specifically in the physics models uh, at that frontier there, and we can demonstrate a high likelihood of very minimal risk to the structural integrity and uh, the durability of that product, then we can affect that perception of what is what is the risk and the inertia to the to the pilot demonstration. Now especially when call it geomagnetic instead of biomagnetic. Yeah. Well so biology leverages abiotic processes and you have the you can only go so far in it before you you know if you really want to create a translate a functional um, analogy across those two uh, very different domains, then you you have to learn a little bit of geophysics. But um, but so did the coral 550 million years ago. And another interesting thing about the coral reef is actually uh, that genetic toolkit for biomineralization has survived all five major extinction events. And they can Color formation is really quite a bit different than geopolymer yes. formation. Yes. Uh, one thing that came up in um, in talking to the Biozina uh, project people was, and, and we know this, but trying we know it anecdotally. We can say standards and codes are really difficult to change, but sometimes it's a matter of setting the conditions right so that when the opportunity for change comes up that the that innovation can happen and to your point about talking to engineers and having them just say we already tried that we're not doing it it's too expensive it's a waste of time um so in the u.s uh, and i i say that because i don't really know how or fear i think it's kind of the same but in the u.s astm is a voluntary and periodic uh, organization for the most part. So when they go and they update the standards that then influence all the building codes and regulations, they they do it period episodically and they get people from academia all over that innovation and value chain together in host conference and then they talk about what they're going to do. And then it takes like five years to have any of those changes really start to trickle down and change things from a very prescriptive standard to a more uh, performance-based standard. So identifying those key verbiage points was something that came out in, from interviewing people from your project, Tanya, uh, the, like, instead of saying uh, a um, cosmolonic su supplementary semantitious material can be put into, you know, this up to this much of the mix design, uh, whether it's 5%, 15, 50, whatever, changing that word from cosmolonic supplementary cementitious material to utilizing an alkaline based reaction, which then opens up a lot more to geopolymer here, right? Because now you've gone from that one specific, we're talking about CSH and, and other ones to a, a broader class that are going to achieve the same sort of uh, structural function. Right? Right. But not knowing that, walking into the room, not having consensus on that, walking into the room when you're going to when that human decision making takes place, um, is going to end up missing that opportunity for for that evolution to occur. You know, another difficulty which you mentioned is uh, the different incentives that people have along the chain from discovery to uh, uh, large scale uh, production. I mean, one thing. 
that we frequently encountered was uh, uh, you come up with something new, you demonstrate it, it in the lab. You go to a plant manager and basically say, look, this is what we found. And it could really help you. Uh, but his um, um, main incentive is to keep that plant running 24 7. So he's not very difficult to persuade him to try something different with the plant. And then the only other route is to uh, basically go through building a very expensive semi works to demonstrate the uh, process. Yeah. And one of the facts of the Denala Meadows places to intervene, um, you know, it, it's understanding what are the preconditions to that that decision to get the plant manager to say yes and hitting their motivation, which is primarily keep the plant running tomorrow. Um, before you walk into the decision, before you ever meet them. One of the things that an, I, an idea that we had that we got to play with was uh, um, we said, OK, well, how do we get the market signal to go up? Like we wanted to increase market signal from clients and customers. Do they know that these materials are available? And do they know that they, uh, like the science is there, is proven beyond model that it's ready for, for brought for an, uh, market scale? Um, but they can't find it you know, when they go to the home improvement store and and the local distributor doesn't carry it. And unless you're working on a very specific project that's very, has a lot of energy behind it, like a very, um, you know, like building out house, right? Like you're not gonna, it's unlikely that you're gonna be able to get people in that, mind, that mindset. So what we, what we thought about, and we tried uh, just, experimentally, anecdotally, but um, was coming up with a, a consumer class product that's, you know, it's not, it's a building material, but it was a flower pot and it was a do-it-yourself kit. And what we were looking to do was to put different, whether it's aggregates or supplementary cementitious, like more experimental things in there and give them the mix design so that they could, and a mold, and they could mix it at home. And then what you're really doing is you're uh, increasing the those surface areas for the in the membrane for the information to, to move in between. And you're doing it where there is, it can potentially cause an economic effect. Now, I'm like, whether that happened or not, no, it definitely didn't, but it was very, you know, one time kind of done write a paper about it, right? In the master's program, not running a company. Um, the uh, but then you have that that part where where the, the distributor is being asked, and maybe not the first time, but maybe the fifteenth time. You know, the person that's ordering it is like, "Hey, can I get it?" So like, it sounds like there's a demand. Does this exist in the market? Can I get it? And the, the customer is then armed with that little bit of information that is, well, it's in the standard. Why don't we have it? And being able to scale the information transfer is something that we have that we have that luxury now that we might not have had uh, prior to this information era. And it's something that I think that we should be cognizant about. It's also something that's really important about like the the Center for Interdisciplinary Education that you're putting up. It's like nature, one of the things that nature does in evolutionary adaptations and evolutionary ecology is that energy and resources are really, they're really much at a premium in nature. So nature does everything to work within the limits of growth, so to speak. And to use energy and materials very, very efficiently. Nature can only do that because nature is very, very good at storing and transferring and reshuffling information, which it does by uh, hereditary material. And all the little abiotic and 
you know, epigenetics things that happen within evolution, but you have the, the genome of any of those bacteria that you're modeling are so complex, you know, that like, you, as, you, as I understood it, you were, um, you got to the point where you had decided I'm going to use this screen and this is my contingency, contingency uh, my other screen, I'm going with this screen of bacteria and it's relative to this large body of, of information, but it was so complex that then you're like, oh darn, we're coming up against a, a funding cycle and we are at the point where we probably have to um, completely map this genome in order to progress to the next through this bottleneck right i say that because that's how much information is encoded in this uh, one uh, prokaryotic cell let alone a eukaryotic organism with an evolutionary history that goes back to the cambrian you know that so sorry to interrupt yeah. i think we're yeah. running a bit out of time so i suggest that we are uh, yeah. close the session online and we can continue the discussion discussion